thanks everyone for joining us today. We've received an incredibly positive response to the interviews we've held with our member senior leaders while they've shared their knowledge and insights following COVID-19. Today I have the pleasure of catching up with Chris, Chris Quinn, CEO of Foodstuffs North Island. Kia ora and good morning and thanks for the opportunity. It's a pretty interesting time for co-ops. Hey, well thanks Chris and um, just as a bit of background, Chris joined Foodstuffs North Island as CEO in September 2015 and since immersed himself in the unique world of grocery, working with the 25,000 strong Foodstuffs North Island cooperative team and its 350 store owners to provide a leading supermarket market experience for New Zealand shoppers. Chris also relishes his role as chairman of business incubator the Ice House and he's on the board of directors for Loyalty New Zealand. Prior to joining Foodstuffs, Chris was CEO of Spark Home Mobile and Business and led the business through the successful rebrand from Telecom to Spark. So I, I guess today it's really quite interesting because we've got the um, International Cooperative Day coming up, which is focused on climate change. And we're taking the opportunity today to discuss how Foodstuffs responding to sustainability both during and post COVID. So thanks Chris mm -hmm. for being part of that conversation. Um, I guess what would be interesting is looking at prior to COVID, foodstuffs had already made inroads in terms of responding to issues around sustainability. The most visible to um, our consumers, I guess, was the removal of plastic bags. Mm. But can you provide us a brief update on the work prior to COVID in this area? Sure, Rob. So look, um, it starts for us with the four promises that we make, um, you know, social promises we tend to refer to them as. Um, so being sustainability leaders in our operations and how we source products is the first one. Uh, making sure every New Zealander has access to healthy and affordable food is the second. Uh, creating meaningful, meaningful and safe work for people and then standing by our local communities so they can thrive. So there are our four social promises. Um, obviously one of the things that you think about quite a bit post COVID and, and during is what order do those need to be in for the situation we're in right now. And I think when you look at the topic at the moment, both in New Zealand domestically and globally, I'm sure people are thinking about, you know, what's the economic uh, impact? Many other countries, it's still a health impact. But what's the economic impact? And then what does that mean to the order of your social promises? But I think the thing we're very sure on is no customer would give us permission to go backwards in our commitment to New Zealand's environment. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I like I like the whole social promises piece. I think it's really important in terms of that knock-on economic impact. So mm. during COVID, um, you know, there was a whole move to social distancing and putting in places measures around, um, you know, hand sanitizer and gloves to stop the spread. Mm. How did this actually um, impact your achievement of your sustainability goals? Look, there's no doubt, um, I remember one moment when we ran out of paper bags for online shopping because of the demand on online shopping went up three to four times. Uh, and we had a night where we sat around going, can we get any plastic shopping bags? And then it was sort of a, you know, a, everyone sitting there looking at each other thinking, can we even have this conversation? Um, we couldn't because there are none in the country. So, um, but look, uh, the thing that took us through and guided us quite a bit during uh, COVID was we, we sat down and said, we've got to make some commitments to New Zealand as a large New Zealand organisation. And as an organisation that had the privilege to be trading um, and the, you know, the privilege to keep our people employed and do all of those things during that time. So we, we said the, the things that would guide our decisions would be supporting New Zealand's economic recovery, um, supporting uh, New Zealand's overall recovery in terms of how people live, healthy and affordable food, meaningful work, supporting local communities and sustainability still counted. So whilst a lot of previous behaviours around bring your own container, around reusable shopping bags, around uh, not packaging plastic, you know, any more than you have to changed because people went, actually, it's more important that you protect my health um, at this point in time and that we have safe food practices. Uh, they've certainly all come back in. And, and I think if you look at supermarkets now, you'll see they're quite different to what they were pre-COVID. We're trying to find the balance as we go forward. So, it's a, you know, food safety still remains number one above anything else. Uh, but then moving back towards what is the new version of food safety and sustainability combined. And as always, the much bigger picture on sustainability. So when I look at some of the things we had done leading into COVID, um, so 93% of our stores divert more than 80% of their waste from landfill now. Um, 
in the last year, we rescued the equivalent of 8 million meals worth of food through local food rescue partnerships. In fact, last week I was down in Wellington, out in Granada um, at KCA, uh, Kiwi Community Assistance, and just a wonderful, you know, one example of the many we deal with around the country. Uh, the guys came up with a scheme to eliminate 10 million cardboard boxes by switching to reusable crates through the supply chain. Those things don't change because of COVID, right? We can keep those going. Uh, the recyclable RPET meat trays, um, and uh, the charging stations for electric vehicles. So we now represent something like 40% of New Zealand's fast charger network. Uh, and I saw in Wellington last week, our 24 ton refrigerated truck that is completely electric. Um, I wouldn't say it's a fully commercial proposition at this time, but it's great to be experimenting and, and trying. Um, and one of the things that did keep going during COVID and the team have done a great job of recovering all the time was the build of our new offices and warehouse site um, out at the airport at the landing. And that will have on, that's going to be, and we got the rating during COVID, a five-star green building, and uh, we'll have the largest solar array panel of any building in New Zealand. So we'll effectively self-power the site. There are bigger, more sustainable things that we can do long-term, um, and they have not been affected by COVID. I think the amount of plastic used in protecting food and keeping us healthy and safe, you know, we're gonna to have to find a new balance post-COVID, um, but the commitment to finding that balance is still exactly the same. Oh, that's fantastic. And I have to say, I have no idea about um, a lot of the work that you've been doing in that space. So it's really good to hear about it because I think a lot of that doesn't actually hit the media. Mm. So in terms of consumer behaviour, what have you seen that's different? Look, it's, um, you know, consumer behaviour, the big changes have been that people have moved to, you know, we used to shop two and a half times a week as a nation. Um, I think during COVID, we prided ourselves on only getting out the door every seven to 10 days and sort of how we thought about meals and planned and that sort of thing. So I think the planning and shopping to a list is a behavior that will stick for a lot of people. Uh, something like 70% of customers we survey, we did a weekly sort of thousand panel, thousand customer panel a week just to get an understanding of trends. Nearly 70% of those people said they would keep planning and shopping to a list. Um, you know, I'm one of those terrible, you know, my family doesn't like sending me shopping because you come back with quite a few things that weren't and many of the things that were on the list, not there. So um, buy New Zealand brands, over 50% of customers are saying they're going to try to buy New Zealand brands. Uh, the thing we're trying to be clear on is what's the premium people would pay for that? Yeah. Because the, va the value pressure that's on, given the economic times, is going to be tough. Um, uh, shopping at different times to avoid crowds. So 40% of people found ways to do that and want to keep doing that. Um, and look, uh, more scratch cooking at home. 40% of people say they're going to keep doing it. Um, more baking at home, 34% of people. Now, I, yeah, I'm personally angry about that because none happened in my house and I feel like I missed out. But um, getting takeaways less frequently, 40% of people said they're going to try to stop, you know, to, to keep not doing that and try to eat a bit healthier. Um, and about 18% more of our customers moved to using online. So those, those are the big trends, right? Planning your shopping, um, shopping at the right times, trying to cook more at home and entertain more at home. Now, there's a great one-liner I've seen a lot of our stores, you know, making home your favourite place to eat. Um, and, and I think that just is this, you know, combined with the new uh, syndrome people talking about the fear of going out, um, mm -hmm. I think the two are coming together a little bit. So, uh, you know, that's what customers are doing differently. Um, there's no doubt sustainability is coming back into the conversation quite quickly. So it disappeared during COVID for reasons that are perfectly acceptable. Um, and we had to change some practices, but, uh, you know, and then the other thing I think is the order of sustainability. So we have healthy and affordable food top of mind at the moment because of the economic impact we can see from this event and what we need to do to help people. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting in terms of the, you know, the next stage of our uh, focusing on the UN sustainability targets and um, business profitability and trying to navigate the balance between the two. You know, for, in terms of that, what do you think the government needs to do to assist enabling fast-tracking sustainability measures? Look, I think, you know, the thing that everyone needs is stability in the measures and stability in the guides. So one of the things, for example, we've written for all of our suppliers is a packaging guideline with 10 guidelines in it. Because we know that to invest in changing the way you produce and the way you package is an expensive exercise, and you need to be able to write a business case that has a reasonable period of return. So we think the most valuable thing we can do is tell people, look, these are our guidelines. This is what we would like you to be able to do in terms of 
what materials, what, what production methods, those sort of things. And if we can stick by those for a decent period of time and not have a, a changing political agenda affect those guidelines, then I think, you know, particularly New Zealand suppliers and manufacturers have got a decent chance of making an investment, getting a fair return on that investment and being able to deliver a result. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things we observed during COVID, um, there were a lot of issues for which there was no rule book written, right? No experience, no previous model. Um, one of the things we tried to do and, and got pretty good success with government was getting them to trust us that we know how to run our industry to some extent. We shared our understanding of the principles they were trying to achieve and then played back what we were going to do to achieve them and, and said, look, if you've got any issues, let us know. But otherwise, let us get on because we think, you know, we, we know a little bit more about running the industry than, than many of you might. Mm. Um, and, and doing that with the right respect and the right level of communication, but not waiting for them to write the answers for your industry because they're not necessarily expert in it. Um, so that, that, you know, the crisis gave opportunity for good accountability and good trust. Um, in the area of sustainability, what we need to do is sort of, you know, I think one of the things for New Zealand companies as a whole is less of a competition, more focus on the impact. Because there is a bit of, you know, point scoring about what announcement everyone can make and what, what things can be done. What we do need to focus on are what are the big long-term changes that we can make. This year, we'll establish our carbon footprint measure. Um, that will give us a fact base that will tell us where we can make the biggest difference in getting our business to a point where it's a carbon neutral operation. Uh, that sounds fantastic. And I guess it's, it is going to be very interesting in terms of the election coming up and the whole political play that um, goes mm. on. You know, in, in terms of watching what's happened and being able to fast track some of this, um, these decisions. That, and as you say, there's been mm. no rule book. And so it has been quite impressive in terms of giving ownership back to the um, businesses themselves. So. Yeah. Fingers crossed it keeps coming. Um, just in terms of the future, what does Foodstuff see as areas of focus to maximise and reduce waste to achieve those sustainability targets that you've touched on? Look, as I said, I think top of our list at the moment is access to healthy and affordable food. So, um, you know, you think about it in terms of education um, uh, choices and leadership. So making sure everyone understands what they're buying and, you know, we've got a food for thought program that we've had for many years that talking to year nine, uh, nine and 10 kids about what, what, how to read a barcode, how to read the content of the products you're buying, how to buy foods that are for every day versus foods that are for treats. Fantastic program run in schools and in stores. Um, uh, reducing food poverty. So, you know, we're, we're making an investment cumulatively by 2025 of over 25 million and trying to address food poverty and play our role in that. Uh, and our own commitment around our own brand. So, you know, our PAMs and value brands, which are nearly 70% manufactured in New Zealand, um, which is probably not something people know. Oh. Um, and, and making sure that they are, you know, we've defined our targets for those in terms of removing more harmful ingredients and for changing packaging to make sure that um, by 2025, we have a pretty good range of product and that it's in good shape from a sustainability point of view. Um, meaningful work for people. So this is part of the wider view of sustainability, which is um, great to see rather than, you know, maybe just focus on environmental because I think you know, the, the wider definition of sustainability is much more useful for a society. Um, so fair and inclusive uh, cooperatives, both to our suppliers and to all of our people and supporting the well-being of our people. So it starts with um, safety and well-being all the way through to careers and futures. Uh, and then something that I think uh, our cooperative model's always been pretty good at, which is supporting local communities to thrive. And that core understanding for every one of our members, one of our store owners, that you know, they're a part of the community they live in, they don't just make a return from it. Um, and uh, keeping that impact high and, and letting, you know, celebrating what they're doing out there. And then in terms of sustainability, um, reducing our carbon emissions. So we joined the Climate Leaders Coalition in New Zealand. So that means we've got to report and set our targets by July, so pretty soon. Um, and working beyond that to get our carbon reduction targets in place based on the facts. And look, no, it's the boring out of sight things that make the biggest difference. So the hard work to make sure that every truck is full and doing a, as smart a route as it can, that has by far a bigger impact on carbon emission than an electric truck. You know, um, it's those things that really make the difference. So it's the roll your sleeves up, use the fact base and, and get into the work that makes a real difference. Um, you know, our refrigeration and our stores, we've, we've well over halved our use of electricity across the network by just having modern solutions to that. 
um, minimising waste. So we want um, all sites, the next step is getting to diverting 90% of waste from the landfill and getting our total land waste tonnage towards zero. Um, packaging sustainability. So the packaging declaration commitment we've done, reducing single use packaging wherever we can, rationalising SKUs, um, and supporting and driving New Zealand's circular economy. There is a great opportunity sitting there for New Zealand to, to complete the loop in terms of what can be recycled and repurposed in country and create an industry that creates employment. Um, and then responsible and ethical sourcing, making sure that everything we source meets those standards, um, both social, labour and environmental standards. So that, that was a very quick run through sort of the agenda for the next period of time, but that's sort of the next 12 to 18 months of focus. Uh, it's fantastic, and I'm sure there will be a lot of people looking in and watching your lead. Um, it's interesting, too, what you were saying in terms of the co-op model in the local community, etc., because mm -hmm. I do find it frustrating when I hear media making reports about duopolies in New Zealand and the lack of mm -hmm. understanding of the co-op model and the fact that actually it's made up a whole lot of um, individual business um, owners. So I think what yeah. from watching in, I've been really impressed in terms of how um, Foodstuffs has handled this. So, Chris, thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate everyone is operating with so many unknowns, which is creating a lot of uncertainty. It's great to hear from leaders such as yourself, sharing your experiences and how you're delivering business outcomes while navigating what is a very uh, challenging environment. Uh, for those of you in leadership roles, heading out member-owned businesses, if you're interested in being part of this network and engaging with your peers, please do get in touch. Cooperative Business New Zealand, is um, here to support member-owned businesses, and we sit across multiple sectors. Your businesses generate around 19% of New Zealand's GDP, so we're looking to extend our reach to enable all New Zealand member-owned businesses to um, participate in what a very important conversation. Kia kaha, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Kia ora.